This is The Michael Bryan Show. Hi everyone, welcome back to the show and today I'm joined with Wendy Kaplan, who is... Reel them off, Wendy. Okay, here we go. So it's Wendy Stewart Kaplan. I am an actress, a model, an interviewer, a podcaster, an MC, a stand-up comedian, an author, and a filmmaker. That is quite the CV or, or Rolodex of things that <laughs> you have, which, which actually sparked my initial question to you, is is that something you've always been, this creative, juggling lots of different things? Has that gone as far back as childhood, as far as you can remember, or have you had to learn it? Well, that that's a very interesting question. Let's just say as a as a child, I was not particularly creative, but I always told my mother that I was going to go to Africa and I was going to be a model. And I remember saying this as a little kid. Now, as a little kid growing up in the Bronx, which w- was great, very working class area. I was a little kid with big dreams. So maybe, you know, you can call my big dreams creative. My mother had been a model, a well-known one, but she gave up everything to marry my father, be a homemaker. You know, that's what a lot of people did back in those days. I had these big dreams of, of glamour. Even as a young child, I could see myself on runways. Isn't that weird? I also saw myself in Africa working with people and working with animals. Now, I don't care if you do believe in being able to prophesize the future or not. I could see it. I could see it. And I just didn't know how I was going to get to it from the Bronx. But I did. And ironically, to your question, that creativity really started to blossom and thrive. I would say like, as I got out of my home after high school or what, I don't know what you call it in the UK. It's not high school. It's le- what do you call it? Upper school or? There's um, primary school, which is sort of up to around 12, 11. And then high school is sort of teenagers up to about okay. 16. So you, you do have high school. That's when, you know, it started to hit me that there might be a bigger world out there. And by the time I hit college, I hit the ground running. I can honestly say to you, I had no idea I was going to go into acting. I knew I was going to be a model. I had no idea that I was going to end up writing a book. But if you pursue your dreams, and I tell everybody this, even if you have the first two things you want to do, it is amazing because the essence of who you are will prevail in the end. You just got to go with it. And you can't go by what other people's standards are. Honestly, my mother wanted me to like, you know, just when I left high school, she said, you might want to think about working for the phone company. And I always I tell this story because that for someone like me, oh, my gosh, that would have been like death, you know. But my mother, like all mothers that love their kids, wanted something that would be safe and secure for me, you know, or the saying was, so you have something to fall back on. That was a very big saying, but you know what? There was no stopping me. I uh, applied to college and knew I was going to major in anthropology. What a crazy thing to major in. You can't get a job (laughs) in anthropology, but the irony, Mike, look at what I do now. I make documentary films I'm a member of the Explorers Club. I've been to Africa five times. I make films about the people and and the animals there. At the Explorers Club, um, you know, uh, I love being a member there. I give the tours in the club, which there's 3,400 people in the world. These are scientists, anthropologists, archaeologists, people that push the boundaries of land, sea, air, and space, astronauts, people that are going up into space, Well, how does, you know, Wendy Stewart Kaplan fit into all of that? The curiosity, the creativity and the curiosity have always been there. I have to ask this as well. Way back when, did you do like child beauty pageants when you imagined yourself being on stage or were they not quite around then? They... I think those were always around. I remember there was an amusement park near me, Miss Palisades Park. And I'd see all these little seven-year-olds, you know, the frilly dresses, the banners, the hair, the crowns. 
And yes, Mike, all of that appealed to me. <laughs> every every aspect of it. <laughs> yeah. But ironically enough, my mom, from being in the fashion industry, she really wanted to protect me from what she thought was going to be harmful. You know, she had had a great career. She really, she modeled with famous people like Lucille Ball and the actress Shelley Winters, who back in the day was Shirley Shrift. And she was a very tiny girl back then. But she had had this career and gave it up to be a homemaker. Whereas, you know, I was having this existence of growing up in the Bronx and all I could think of was, you know, my big dreams. How am I going to get out? They say that some children are born of the world and some children are born of the town. And I was born of the world. And the pageants had nothing to do with me because, you know, nobody was pushing me in that direction at all. And I really aspired to do that. So when I was old enough, which was 14 years old, I went to my first model agency, which was Ford Models. Now you have to understand as a kid, I've morphed into something. I, I wouldn't have hired me for a model when I was like 14, 15 or 16. I was truly an ugly duckling. When I see pictures of myself from back then and I had very mousy brown hair, a large nose, too large for the rest of my face. And, and I wasn't skinny. I was like, a, you know, probably a size 10. And I would walk into a model agency and they would look at me like I had two heads. But then again, you know, you have the dream. I, and I, I tell this to your listeners, you can morph yourself into ever you want to be. You just can't listen to all the outside chatter. You have to follow your own heart. And even though I knew at the time I would go into a model agency, the girls, they were all perfect. They were either brunette and skinny and all their facial features were perfect. And I was so far from perfect, but I knew I could shape myself, right? Like clay into something else. And that is exactly what I've I've been doing my entire career, including when the pandemic hit and I lost everything. And we'll talk about that after. So often people can't be curious because they've got this whole protection, safety, having something to fall back on. And it creates this environment where their brain can't quite function in the same way that it would if it was completely safe. You had everything to fall back on, everything would be okay. There's an argument that that can stop people from working. Like if they don't need to work, they don't need to survive, then they won't do anything. You've got the two sides of the coin, haven't you? Those that will be curious and strive for more because they've got the safety. And then there's the kinds of people that because they're safe, well, I don't need to do anything. Right. So you have to, as a human being, be so curious, you are willing to put yourself in unsafe situations. And my first shot out of the bag, you know, my parents moved from the Bronx to Florida. I got a job in a mall. I got enough money to apply to a university back up in New York in upstate New York. And ironically enough, I had no idea, but they had a study abroad program in Africa of all places. All right. I found that out when I got in there and I thought to myself, oh, I'm going to apply to that program. I'm really curious about that program. And at that point, I was away from my family. It's very important, you know, not that it's a good thing to be away from your family, but often we have this buzz, right? The thing that runs through your head. What do you need it for? You can go and do something safe, something that, you know, that you'll fall back on, something that will always produce a paycheck. But at what point does the the light bulb go off in your head and say, no, 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 no. I can't do that. That's a trap for me. And as we all start to discover ourselves, and I was lucky, I went away to college and that's when it happened, right? There were no safety nets how to make new friends, new school, I find out about this program to study in Africa through the Black Studies Department. Well, I wasn't taking any courses in the Black Studies Department, but I had a boyfriend who was a filmmaker who said to me, listen, you're in anthropology. I'm a filmmaker. Let's apply. I'm like, we're not going to get in. He said, let's do it anyway. So that was, see, that was my mother's voice in my head. You're not going to get in. Why are you going to get in? We applied. We not only got in, but weeks later, I found myself in a village called Ife, 
in Nigeria. And that was the beginning, Mike, of that curiosity really blowing through the roof because I saw things that I could not explain. I saw a way of life that I couldn't explain. I had, I had no, not only no safety net, nothing, no comfort zone, no McDonald's golden arches, nothing. I, I, the college was probably the university of Ife was probably the most familiar thing because it was a university but even with that, our, our outside activities, I became a member of the Palm Wine Drinkers Club. We would go up to a hut. <laughs> oh, it's <was> fabulous. When <laughs> most of you who don't know, and I'm sure many don't, and I didn't know what Palm Wine was. It's like moonshine here. We would go up to a hut in, in, the, in the mountains where, you know, people who were living up there, they didn't have running water. They cooked on the open fire. I can still talk to you now, I'm smelling that open fire. And we would drink our pine, palm wine up there and everybody would have things that they wanted uh, to talk about. So it was about camaraderie, just like going to a bar and having a beer with your friends. But here I am in this, this remote country doing this with, with local people, Again, people from the Yoruba culture, some at the university, they did know English. But when I would go into the towns or the villages around there, no, nobody knew English. And I had to learn Yoruba. And I, I, I'm so proud of myself. I did learn enough to get by. Like, Odabo means, you know, hello. Kini Aruko Re means what is your name? I was once again curious. I wanted to learn more about the language to converse with the people. But what was so funny. I would walk through the village and I would hear people go, oh, da bo, oi, bo. And it was just like that. Oh, da bo, oi, bo. So I was like, oi, bo, what does that mean? I couldn't find it anywhere in my studies. And finally, somebody said to me, what it means is, hello, white skin on an orange. You know, when wow. I was saying hello, foreign person. <laughs> I mean, people just didn't see where I was that many Westerners, you know, uh, the professors at the university had, but the kids in the village, a lot of them were just like they would hide behind their mother's skirts and everything. I had waistly blonde hair. I looked so weird to them. But again, the curiosity, I was curious about them and what allowed that curiosity to come out when I was living in Nigeria was out of my comfort zone, the food, rice with fish rice with plantains, rice with goat meat, if you were lucky, all right? They had a black market there where there was a guy who knew I liked jelly roll. Couldn't, you couldn't get that anyway. So he had the way he got the jelly roll from me and I would buy it from him. There was another guy in the village that had a restaurant, you know, but they made rice and really local dishes. He knew I was from the United States. He learned how to make hamburgers for me and they were darn good. But look at all these amazing experiences I had because I was curious enough to go out there and not not worry about what was going to happen to me. You can't. You just have to go for it. So how did you navigate those waters? Because it sounds like it's unknown moment to moment. You're basically thinking about it while you're doing it and you've no idea how it's going to go, what it's going to be like what's your thought process around the individual like not knowing what's going to happen that is such a great question okay and I can tell you it's learning as a human being to listen to your heart listen to your own inner voice all right and and those other thoughts that creep in, because I've mentioned them, you really have to be able to block them out. They're, no, they're of no use to you. All right. What the heck am I going to do if I start with what if? What if that? What if I get sick? What if, you know, they had overthrown the government when I was there? That was scary. But I didn't allow myself to think, oh, what if I get taken hostage? I was in the northern part of Nigeria at one point where the Boko Haram are, who they recently, they're under a different name now, but those are the ones that kidnapped all those Nigerian schoolgirls. I was walking around that town with my waist length blonde hair with not a care in the world. And I would see them go, they rode on horses, they had sabers on the side and their heads were all wrapped. You could only see their eyes. They had their heads wrapped in, in cloth. And not for one minute did anything go off in my head that made me feel like I had to be afraid. It is fear that stops us 
from doing what we need to do. It is fear that stops you from listening to your inner voice, okay? I was out of my comfort zone. I didn't have a choice, Mike. I had to go with my heart and my instincts. And I I have to tell your listeners this, the most important thing that anyone can do is really develop those instincts that we are all born with them. But you know, when you have a hunch about somebody or something or a bad feeling, you absolutely go with it. Nature has made all of us so very efficient. We are born with that. I have a friend that my friend, Daniel Simmons, who I love to death, but he is the most non-spiritual person. And he, you know, always says Wendy and her mumbo. I'm sure we all know people like that. Wendy and her mumbo jumbo. But you know what? I have made things go well in my own life, which is not to say I have. I have bad things happen. We all do. We're human beings. But you know what? It's got to do with how you react to the thing. And it's got to do with what your own gut tells you. At this point in my life, I am completely going really by my instincts. And a lot of the time I have to just block out that outside chatter because it's it's not going to help me. Listen to your heart. Listen to your mind. It won't lie is useful how you actually describe it to sort of weed out the things to essentially like use while you discard the rest is is useful the phrase that you've used um useful is the phrase and while we're talking you know my big confession here on your show today i read a lot of those self help books the reputable ones like the secret um, and that the whole series that came with that. Um, Mark Stephen Puller has, uh, he's from your neck of the woods. I forgot where he is, but he's not far from you. And he has a book out, Tips to Create the Life You Desire. Why do I read these books? I like to read books of people that have been through any kind of challenge in life and then wrote a book about it because I feel all of us can learn from those people. And I I really take that information and use it because all of us, people come up to us and everyone's always telling you what you should do or their opinion. And I always think, consider the source. You have to consider the source. What has that person been through? Is this just their opinion? Are they smart? You have a lot of, my God, surely one thing we've learned from the pandemic in both of our our countries, you know, our officials say stupid stuff, really stupid. (laughs) And people, right, and, and here we are, and it's up to you to question it, right? To put it through the mix master of your own head and and question it and think about what they're saying. The ability to question, again, that's something that we all have. I do question. And there are people that um, will often not be happy with me because, you know, even if I'm booked on a project, I, I will cloak my words carefully. You know, when you're working with a director or an author or someone, or producer, you have to be careful. You don't want to step on creative toes. So I've learned how to um, bathe my words in kindness. So it just comes out like a question that I absolutely have to have answered. You know, we all have the right to do that. Never be afraid to question. What stops you from taking the questioning to a level where you don't actually know anything because you're questioning so much that you start to question yourself in a way that can become quite almost detrimental to the result like how do you i say usefully question yourself and usefully I'm, question I'm things. this conversation so let's talk about usefully questioning oneself no you know what that is really great Because that's something that many people are afraid to do, because then you go down that rabbit hole, right? Where it's like, what if, what if, oh my God, I don't know, blah, 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 blah. I, I will, it's my instinct that makes me red flag certain things. And by red flag, this is a hard one to explain. Something that someone will say will play in my head. Why is it playing in my head? Why am I still thinking about it? I write it down and I look at it, okay? Why am I having the feelings I'm having about it? Then I have to go into my own head. All right, Wendy, are you afraid? 
what's scaring you about this? You know, why are you worrying? I'm a big worrier, by the way. I'm, you know, I'm just like, I'm human, right? I worry, I have fear, but I will question where that's coming from. And when, and I will get the answer to it. And if it's something like, well, you're just afraid, you're afraid of failing. And by the way, Mike, nine out of 10 times, that will be the answer. You're afraid of failing or you're afraid of what people think. So why are you afraid of failing? Why are you afraid of what people think? You have to ask yourself that. And, and I will. It's almost like you park your ego at the door and you have to answer those questions for yourself. And, and I do. Now, instinctively, if something still doesn't feel right to me, I might just, you know, have to, to park it on the side for a bit and have faith that things will work out. If someone I meet really feels bad to me, and I mean really bad, I really have to question, you know, I have to question why I feel that way about that person, why I feel their aura is so dark. And not nine out of 10 times, I'm right about it. The frustrating thing uh, for me, and this is something I've had to learn to deal with, and I still don't deal with it well. I always wonder, why isn't everybody else seeing that that person is a bad person, that the words that they're saying are lies? It's so evident to me. And I will tell you 99 and nine tenths of the time, it turns out to be right, my original gut feeling. So I will, I will have little to do with them. But what I've learned, and this is a hard one for me, Mike, and I'm still working on it. I can't change other people's minds. I can't, you know, I've learned this through the, the pandemic with, you know, people that, that are here that just refuse to mask or vaccinate or do any of those things. You know, I try to talk reason, but I can't, there's a lot of people I can't talk reason with. And I won't. I, I have to like, you know what? Give up, Wendy. You're not going to get anywhere. That's a hard thing, by the way, for me to say give up. I don't give up easily. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I imagine you wouldn't, given the, the conversation today and the amount of unknowns that, that you've had to, to overcome over the, the years, giving up is something you're probably not all that well versed in which which speaks to things like being consistent ever so slightly stubborn <laughs> that that just allows you to keep going no matter what happens it's almost like effective stubbornness in a way because you've got to push through certain things in order to to really achieve it would you say that is your personality or do you think that other people, including the, the listeners, can maybe create a bit of a program for themselves to learn it as a skill? I think people can, if they so desire. If your life isn't working the way you want it to work, you may not have my grit and determination, which is over the top. I'm the first one to admit it. But they can certainly change things in their life through their own determination. Like we all have dreams. Maybe there's something that you wanted to study or something that you wanted to become that was so far out of reach. You may not be able to get that thing, but you know what? You can get close to it. And it is my determination and my belief that, that I can say to myself, you may not get that exact thing, but you know what? If you keep on going and not let things stop you, you can absolutely make it happen. And I, honestly, anyone who knows me will tell you, I practice what I preach. I was turned down by every model agency when I was 21 years old. Anybody else would have given up. All right. I could have gone for a master's degree. There was lots of things I could have done. I just shot more pictures from my portfolio and kept doing it until I finally got an agency to take me. And, you know, all of our lives are, they're like little building blocks, right? You know, there's a foundation and then you make the foundation a little bigger, a little bigger. And then you constantly, constantly want to build on it. Okay. So you take it to the point when you introduced me, I said, oh my God, I've got so many titles. How are you going to remember them? Yeah. They're not things I've done. They're things I'm still doing. Right. Because my foundation, I'm, I'm still building on that. I'm not looking to stop any of the things that I did. They're all really great things. They're great things for me. My philanthropy, I'm try, I try and use every single thing that I do um, as a platform for humanitarian causes which um, I run, I'm one of the people that helps run an LGBTQ in the tri-state area for a non-for-profit. I make no money doing that. That's one of my causes. 
The films that I make with my husband are about raising awareness about gorilla and chimpanzee rescue in, in Cameroon because they're they're being poached. You know, my knowledge that I get from being a member of the Explorers Club last night, I got to meet an incredible speaker, thank God, in person because all of our lectures have been live. Now we're having amazing people from all over the world come again. This guy runs a foundation for giraffes. Did you have any idea, Mike, how giraffes, how often they're being poached? I didn't. No, no, no idea. Right. I'm so busy thinking about gorillas, chimpanzees, and rhinos, right? I wasn't thinking about a giraffe, and and it's terrible what's happening. And their giraffes are in large parts of Africa. This person raised my awareness. I connected with him. Maybe there will be an opportunity for me to have him on one of my podcasts, okay? Or a show that I, my, it is my goal to develop about interviewing explorers that are making huge differences in the world. But you see, you your mind has to be open. And then we're back now to that creative process. You open your mind, you open your heart, and then your creative process and the curiosity that led you to the thing is allowed to shine through. One of the things that I want to touch on very quickly just before we sort of move the, the journey on a little bit, which is fascinating, by the way. I'm, I'm so glad I can just sit and listen because this is amazing. Thank you. One of the things that really perked my interest up was your ability to ask helpful questions. Someone said to me many years ago is a lot of people ask themselves questions that they don't actually want to hear the answers to. So if you picture you ask the question, your brain gives you the answer. The amount of times people say, oh, why me? Why has it happened to me? And there's probably a little voice that gives you the answer and you don't like what that answer is. What sort of questions do you use that give you the answers that actually drive you and, and push you forward? I ask myself questions like, why are you doing this? Why is this important to you? What's your, what's your final goal? What do you want to get out of it? Is it ego driven? The ego can be, by the way, a, a bad, bad thing. All right. So where do, where do you want to be? And my big thing is um, end product. I'm a Capricorn. I climb mountains, but I don't want to keep climbing and not getting that gold ring off the merry-go-round. I have to ask, not only am, what am I getting from it? For me to get what I need, I need to see the results in somebody else. Whether I'm interviewing somebody and, and that interview is great and that person that I'm interviewing is, is speaking gems that I know are going to help people. Or, you know, in general, when you start to question yourself, you will find that some of the answers are kind of ugly. And as a human being, you have to be true to yourself and say, why do I, um, why do I dislike this person so much? You know, people will say to me, oh, just forget about them. I have a hard time forgetting about them. And that, that's my bad, Mike, honestly. So I have to work on that. Um, when I have the thought of that person and I think the bad, bad feelings towards them, I just, um, I've learned this technique. You have to replace it with a positive thought. So I replace the negative thought about the bad person with a positive thought about a good person. So much of this is really uh, training your mind. And if, if you read um, any of the books like The Secret or The Magic, any in that series, there's a lot of that in there. But reading is one thing. You need to learn how to practice it. You know, and say to yourself, what is, what is that feeling? Why do I have that feeling? And um, one of the things I've learned, you can replace the bad feeling with a good feeling. That is not to say there are not days I wake up and, you know, this time has been particularly challenging because we talked about safety nets. When the pandemic hit, every safety net I had, a career that I spent decades building, everything about who I am and what I'm about got blown up. Right. I couldn't travel to make films. I couldn't perform on a stage. There were no stages. Modeling jobs were all canceled. Lost my biggest client that I used to pay, you know, a lot of my bills with and was just left with like, 
well, what am I going to do now? My friends that had taken the safety net route, right, with the job to fall back on, that are performers, but they had the day job. You know, I've never had a day job. I've always done things and projects and, and films and gigs. All right. So I, I was left with a great big void. There was actually this, you'll find this funny. There was a group on Facebook. Um, it was started by a group of actors and film people. And the name of it was the pandemic hit. All my work is gone. And now I'm left with a great big void. <laughs> oh God. I thought, I, you know what? There was so, it was so great in the early days of the pandemic to like go on there at least because I did have a lot of friends that, you know, God bless them. They were able to work at home and make a great salary. But the performers, the musicians, any, anyone that is in the entertainment industry, I'm not talking about the stars, because the stars, they got to isolate with their in their pod with all their paid people in their mansions. <laughs> Believe me, they weren't hurting. The performers were holed up in New York in their tiny little apartments. You know, many people have tiny little apartments. It's New York. And everything that we had all done came to a crashing halt. So you had to really think quick on your feet. It was for it was for me a big lesson. You know, and here we go again. Risks, curiosity. Oh my God, what am I going to do? Better come up with an answer quickly. Go into your head, go into yourself, and it will be there. So what motivates you to this day then? I know we want to discuss how you how you pivoted and reinvented yourself during the pandemic, but what's your motivations currently? Like what drives you forward? I'm just it should be fairly obvious. I'm a very driven person. There if, if you know if I see it and I want it, I'll I'll go for it. Uh if it's something that I want to do. People say to me, you don't know, I don't have a filter. I don't have fences around me. Um, The curiosity, I will ask anybody anything. If I meet somebody that I think I can work with on a project, or maybe I can't work with them, but you know what? Maybe there's something I'll end up doing with them. I will connect with them. I will follow up with them. Uh, I will read about who they are. You know, God bless. We have the internet now. You can, you can, so many people doing incredible things out there. I was on another show in your neck of the woods where, you know, the host turned me on to this incredible park where they're helping primates, you know, and people can go and see and see the primates. So if I hadn't agreed to go on to that show, I would have never met those people. I agree to everything. If it feels good and I think it's going to make me grow as a human being, then I'm just going to go for it. That's something that's in me. No filter, nothing stops me, pure determination. And the fact that I I feel, you know, we're all just passing through here. I have today, tomorrow will be whatever it is, but nobody has has a guarantee on a tomorrow. That's something that the last two years certainly should have shown us. What can we do to live each day as loud and as great as possible? And make magic happen, which is not to say I don't, you know, I get down like anyone else, but I, I try not to let those feel, feelings overwhelm me because those feelings end up like just they immobilize you. You know, they put you in a place where you can't move. And for me, it really is about, you know, I got to be able to move. It's a very interesting point, actually, because a combination of questioning yourself, overcoming some of the fears linked with the curiosity it's almost like if you keep moving forwards a lot of the mistakes don't matter as much because you keep moving forwards they're like it, it, it balances each other out and counteracts everything and i'm cool with the mistakes like you said the the mistakes i'm okay with mistakes and failures you know and i'm not afraid for somebody to see me lord knows listen when you become like a high profile person There's a lot of people waiting for you to fall. They are just waiting for your demise because that is, you know, human nature. You you know, you watch animals in the bush. They look for the weakest one, but I'm not waiting for my demise. I'm, I have something happen. I fail. It's cool. I have to just move forward, go on to the next thing. It doesn't make me a less of a person or a bad person. It just means I failed 
at the thing I was trying to do, got to come at it a different way, or maybe I shouldn't come at it at all. Maybe I need to find something else. That's all all right. So we're a few years into the pandemic as of this recording. You had to undergo quite the transformation, shall we say, when the pandemic hit as your industry essentially came to a, a grinding halt, as you said. So talk to us a bit about what was running through your mind at the time. What questions did you ask yourself that allowed you to come up with everything that you do? I'm really glad we can um, talk about this because it's pivotal to who I am now. I'm a different person than the one you would have interviewed two years ago. I'll never be the same. Okay. I'll never be the same because like so many of us, all of a sudden we had like a little bit of control over our worlds and the things we, we did. All of a sudden this thing came. Now keep in mind, I'm in Africa. I've experienced malaria, yellow fever, typhoid. I took malaria pills for a mosquito that could infect you right through the malaria pills that I was taking. We've been in villages that are near Ebola. So I knew about this stuff. But what when this thing came, first of all, it's good that you hit on this chord with me because we haven't talked about how anger motivates a person to move forward. I was so pissed off. About a week before it came to New York, you know, I'm a big person in supporting all of my friends. And I went out to clubs every night to see friends that were performing. And we were told in New York, like the, it was probably the beginning of March that this thing was coming, but it was never clear what the thing was. Any, anytime you Googled any news, you were shown this stupid graph. Well, I wasn't good in graphs. Okay. I'm not a math person. You would see this graph and they were saying, this is coming. New York city is going to be hit really bad. We have to flatten the curve. Do you understand what flatten the curve meant? Because I sure as heck didn't. You know, they showed you the graph of how it was going to hit and people were going to get sick. And then, you know, if we did this, this and this, things would go flat. But it still it wasn't a tangible mark. You know, it wasn't anything I could sink my teeth into. So the night before they shut New York down, I was at a club called the Merck Lounge, very famous, well-known club, and a very uh, famous musician was there, Michael C. Hall, who's also on a series in uh, the, the United States, which I'm sure you can pick up in the UK. It's called Dexter. It's about a serious ca- serial killer. This is a very famous guy. And I had organized a bunch of my friends. I'm like, come on, this is going to be our last hurrah. They're shutting New York down the next day. We went to see him. There were supposed to be two shows. And of course, you know, being an influencer, I did my photo ops with him and everything. Really great guy, great band, wonderful performance. And the show's over and all of us are leaving. And that was when they didn't have the second show that it dawned on me that this thing was very real. I was not in denial for one minute, but how could any of us know what exactly it was? I mean, the only viruses all of us in the world have ever really dealt with, you know, the flu virus, the cold virus, a stomach virus. I'm sure as a kid growing up, you know, you experienced all of that. Me too. But this was a different kind of virus. And even with all my knowledge, and I have a lot of it, I couldn't wrap my head around it. My clue should have been the Explorers Club. We have some of the most world-renowned scientists that are members in our New York club. I did a presentation there about a week before they shut New York down about making my film with my husband, Whispers and Witnesses, about rescuing gorillas and chimpanzees in Cameroon. And I'm very well liked at the club. And my, my speaking wasn't well attended. So I called up a bunch of my friends And I'm like, how come you didn't come? And they said, I don't feel comfortable being in the room I was in. The Apollo room was very low ceilings and crowded. And they didn't feel comfortable coming because this virus was coming. And my husband and I remember both of us saying, my God, don't you think they're overreacting a little bit? Well, because they're scientists, they really understood viruses. And a lot of them knew about what was going on in the lab in Wuhan. And I can't definitively 
point a finger at that, but we've all heard, you know, we know that they were studying coronaviruses there. We know the United States was also involved in studying coronaviruses there. Do I think it was a bat in the marketplace? No, I don't. Very easy to point it on that. But we, you know what, we have nothing to hang our hat on. Obviously, these scientists that studied viruses that were members of my club knew a lot more than I did. So March 12th, they're, they shut everything down in New York. And the reality of it really started hitting me. And I said to my husband, we're standing in our kitchen. Now he's a photographer and cinematographer. Well, we got nothing to shoot now. And I have no job I can possibly do. And I watched every client, every booking, every future booking I had out the window. We're talking like watching thousands of dollars gone. And in my kitchen, I said to him, we have to come up with something. And I said, I know we'll do a cooking show. And he said to me, but Wendy, you don't cook. Exactly. <laughs> and that's how <laughs> the idea for pandemic cooking with Wendy was born. Now, what it enabled me to do, and if you get to watch any of the segments, and it's on Wendy Stewart TV, my YouTube channel, I am there in full costume, full makeup, all kinds of wigs, and I do all kinds of characters. So here I am getting to use my stand-up comedy, my acting wardrobe, my performance abilities. And it was really a great comedy show, or as one of my friends said, it was like watching a comedic drag show. That's really what it was. It didn't have so much to do with cooking, although my, I cook on the show. I would find fun, simple recipes, and that was part of the fun. Okay, why did I do this? Because every single thing I I try and do in my life is to affect something else. People were in rock bottom depressions now. They, uh, in New York, oh my God, people got sick left and right. I am talking to you from 79th Street in the city. I'm on the 10th floor. The sound of the ambulances never stopped. Our hospitals were filling up. And then I'm on Facebook and I see people I know, so-and-so's on a ventilator. Oh my God, I tested positive, um, but I couldn't, I, you know, the hospital turned me away. They turned people away. They sent you home. All right. You had to be so sick. And then if they didn't have a bed for you, they started to triage, like how, you know, how did they decide? I had friends that were, they died. And five days after the pandemic hit, I'm sitting in my living room, getting ready to do pandemic cooking with Wendy. I had a wig and a tutu on, and I was feeling really warm and not feeling well. And my daughter said to me, I can't taste anything. I just tried to eat. I said, I can't taste anything either. And my husband, I had fed him. I ordered all these ready-made meals. Every meal I gave him, he said, tastes like wood. I'm like, why is he complaining? I didn't even cook this stuff. I was cooked by other people. Tastes like wood. My whole family had come down with COVID. And the first thing I did is I called my doctor, couldn't reach him. What happened? I don't know if this happened in the UK, but man, half of our medical profession, I feel like just they didn't know what to do. My dermatologist completely shut down his practice, never to return again. My primary care doctor called me back after two days and prescribed uh, Azithromax for sinus infections. I'm like, how could all three of us have sinus infections? He said, oh, that's exactly what you have. I knew we had COVID. My daughter said to me, we had COVID. And it's scary because you're breathing shallow. You can't smell or taste anything. And there's nowhere to turn. I called all those numbers. The CDC gave us the 800 numbers. Then I got people on the phone that are supposed to give you information. Well, I don't know if you have COVID. Smell and taste loss is not part of COVID. Really? Are you out of your mind? So this was the very early days and the beginning. Well, you know what? I had that tutu on and that wig on and I got up and I shot yet another episode of Pandemic Cooking with Wendy because I thought if I'm going to pass out, it's going to be my own kitchen and my own home. There's no hospitals that would admit anybody anyway. You had to really, really, really be sick. And guess what? We made it through. And I continued to shoot the show. And the best part of pandemic cooking with Wendy for me was the comments that came from all over on Facebook. Hi, I've been sick for two months. I love seeing your show. I've subscribed to your YouTube channel. Thank you for making me feel better. You made me laugh today. That was the whole reason behind it.
I wasn't like discovered for the next TV series. I was out there actually helping people every day. And there's a group um, I interviewed called the Golden Gays. I had them on my entertainment show and I have to quote them. And I always give them credit for the quote. They said, entertainers are also the essential workers. And we are. We had to keep the spirit going. I mean, the amount of depressed people even now, no one is dealing really with the emotional effects of this, all right? Myself included, all the ways I earned money had totally stopped. So it occurred to me that there's other things I can do. And I started doing people's podcasts, guest hosting, being being a guest, because Lord knows, as you've already witnessed, I have a lot to say about everything. (laughs) I can talk about my book or the films that, that, that I make. I can talk about living my entire life in New York. So I started doing people's podcasts. And then in January of, my God, it's only a year ago, I came up with the idea for an entertainment show at a restaurant that helps performers all the time. They have a cabaret room. And the show is called If These Walls Could Talk. And myself and my co-host, Tim Moss, bring on people from all over, musicians all over the world, because we can, right? Because it's on StreamYard and it's a podcast. So started doing that and really started honing who I was as an interviewer, because as you know, you know, you're getting people from all over other than what you read about them online. It's not like somebody that you know, or you're meeting in person and can get a vibe from, right? You and I today are one dimensional. All right, we're flat screened, but we're not really one dimensional. Okay, we're having this incredible conversation. So for me, it was learning how to use another medium to communicate and be able to to help people and ultimately help the world. What were some of the biggest lessons that you've learned about yourself during that time? And how can other people learn more about themselves as well so my hope is that some of the biggest lessons for you are things that other people can probably take with them but then if you can recall a process or a series of moments I suppose where you had to sit down and really think about what you wanted to do that might help people as well so what would you say to that well it was largely self-motivation Remember, I had people up at my husband always says to me, I sat around and waited to be booked. Not that I sat around. I'm this creative person. But, yeah, it was, you know, my agent would call me or a friend would call me. And, you know, I had a certain way of doing things. And I knew I would hear from a certain amount of people that would get me things or I'd be able to connect with a certain amount of people. I completely couldn't do that anymore, could I? Here I was in my lonesome, in my apartment, isolating with COVID on on top of it. I had to not only tap into that self-motivation, all right, but I had to really start to allow thoughts come to my head. Instead of feeling sorry for myself about losing my income, which was really scary, losing my ability to be out there. Remember, I'm a people person. I'm a performer. I need an audience. I had to shift the way I thought about things, which is possible for any of us to do, except I know friends that didn't do that at all. And I still know people that still think it's going to be the way it was before. I can honestly tell you it's not going to be the way it was before. Nothing that we knew will ever be the way it was before. And that's not necessarily a bad thing. All right. We've the world has gone through this together. My God, how many things can you say that about in our time that that we're experiencing the same thing? You know, I joined this loss of smell and taste group because I lost my smell and taste for eight months. And that was scary. And I'm in this group and it's online. It's run by researchers in the UK. And I'm meeting people from Tagestan. I'm in touch with people that speak English in China um, from all over the world. We have this common denominator. We're sharing notes. This is what I did to, to bring my smell and taste back. You know, the medical industry, when you ask them, they're like, I don't know. We're not really sure why it happens. I can tell you there's something called smell training that was brought out by these researchers in the UK using essential oils and literally sniffing it, sniffing it every day for uh, periods throughout the day. Eucalyptus, 
lemon oil, and there's one more. It might be, it might be lavender. We're talking very strong scents. For whatever it does, and they don't know why it works 100%, it kicks off stuff in your brain. All right, so now we're really in Brave New World stuff here. But you know what, Mike, did any of us have a choice? I would tell people what you learn from this to thine own self be true. You had to really start to look within and see how you were going to navigate these times because these are times like never were before. I also believe, though, these are brilliant times to be able to start anew. What have we learned? Well, maybe there's something that you always wanted to do. Guess what? Go for it. It's out there. You can go for it. All right. The world's in a, in a different place. The world certainly, I mean, it's topsy-turvy. Politically, don't even get started. And it doesn't matter which part of the world you live in. It's a mess. There's nobody out there that doesn't agree that it's a mess. You got to say to yourself, what can I do to make my individual life better? And guess what? By doing that, you're going to help all the people that you come in contact with. It's not selfish to make your life better. It will help a lot of other people. There's a lot to unpack regarding like the individual responsibility, I guess. And it's almost like if everybody took steps to improve their own life then the world improves there's a real sense of like well if we look after ourselves a little bit if everyone does that that's everyone improved automatically isn't it right right you have to believe though that that's possible so for many people that's a hard pill to swallow so to speak you know that by their own self-improvement and being positive, they can affect other people. I learned a, a long time ago because I went through the AIDS epidemic too. That um, I can't, I can't fix the world. You know, as a little kid, I thought I could. You know, when you're little and you donate to all these animal organizations, mine was uh, one where they were saving baby seals, <laughs> and I would send a dollar donation. I remember doing this, thinking my dollar would help the baby seals. But you know what you learn. No matter how big your donation is, you can't help all the baby seals. You can't change the entire world, but you can affect the people that you deal with. When I did pandemic cooking with Wendy, just to get a comment that I brightened somebody's day, you know what? That is that's enough for me. That's huge, actually. When you when you think about it, making somebody's day better that's a really cool thing because if their day is better, my day will be better too. That's just the way it works. So what convinced you to start your book then? Because if I'm right, you never really intended on writing a book. You probably wouldn't have called yourself a writer at the time. So what sparked the desire to write the book? So I came to New York in the 80s, late 70s, early 80s, and I kept... Uh, I have over 200 photo albums of everything that went on in my life. You know, the way some people journal. I never thought of myself as someone that could journal. You know, I wrote poetry for a long time, but I never took that seriously. Never wrote a journal, but took tons of pictures and had been in, I've been in New York for decades and still going strong. There's not a ton of us. There is a site on Facebook. I'm a New York dinosaur. I'm a New York dinosaur. <laughs> you know, I'm definitely part of that group and celebrities of the 80s and 90s. I, I love these groups on Facebook because they're great because there's a ton of us around that are, you know, still writing, still performing, making incredible art. And it's wonderful to be able to get it out there. I never expected to write a book, but when people started knowing who I was and the experiences I had had, you know, coming to New York, modeling, getting turned down by every agency, trying to get into Studio 54, turned down there every time. When I, when I read my own book, it's like, girl, you were turned down for so many things, so many times. And um, I realized it's not a memoir. It really is a book about inspiration. It's about having every door shut in your face and just finding another door, one you can walk through. You know, one that you knock on, it just opens up and you can walk through it. So I wanted to tell those stories. And uh, a couple of my friends said to me, you really should write this. I had no idea how to, how to do that, how to organize, write thoughts for decades. I had the photo albums. 
but that was it. And um, there were so many memories with so many drunken nights in clubs. They were all fragmented in my head. I couldn't remember half of them. I would look though at the pictures in the photo albums and go, oh my God, I remember that. So I thought I could write a really funny book, except I wasn't a writer. So I thought, and this is the way the universe works. A friend of mine said to me, um, you need to get a proposal together. So I had a person who was living with me at, a, at the time, who was a producer, who was a friend at the time. And she said, I can help you get the proposal together. And, you know, she typed up like a bunch of little sample chapters, but from my words, I spoke and she typed them. See, I didn't even realize that's a technique you can use to write a book that work, works great for people like me. And, um, you know, we sent the proposal off and we didn't get, back any any responses or we got back responses not what we're looking for right right now at the same time ironically enough my daughter was working for a literary agent and she came home with a pile of books in a shopping bag I go what are those she said well they want me to look through these to see which books they might consider so that shopping bag with all those books sat in my bedroom the entire summer. She never looked at any of those books. And, right. But I, I tell you this story because this is a story of inspiration also. If you're a writer out there and you're sending your books off to, you know, to have them looked at, there may just be like some intern that gets sent home with them and those books never get seen. Don't give up. You believe in your project. You don't hear back in a certain amount of time. Find another agent, right? Send your book to another agent. So I was seeing kind of how things worked and I thought, all right, I've got these sample chapters. I called up a friend of mine that was a published author. Um, he was well known. There was a woman that had 16 separate personalities. Her name was Sybil. She is world renowned schizophrenic artist. They'd made movies about her. My friend, Patrick Sirachi, wrote her life story. So he was the only person I knew that had a literary agent. And he's like, I told him what I had. And he knew me from the studio 54 days. We used to go together. He said, you know what? Send me what you have. So I did. And he called me back and he said, I think this is hilarious. I think it would make a great book. He said, I want you to see my agent. So he sent me to see his agent, Mimi Strong. And I left, you know, my chapters and proposal off with Mimi Strong, who called me up. She said, this is hilarious you don't have a book. I said, okay. She said, but I have somebody I think you can work with that will help you create a book. And I'm like a ghostwriter. I don't want one of those. She said, no. She said, what you will do is you will converse with him over the phone. He'll put it in a tape recorder. He'll get all of those thoughts like that. I'm telling you about Mike that couldn't quite get together. David Wallace put those thoughts together for me. And they were, it was only my words. And there it was. It came together on paper. He was in Palm Springs. I was in New York, nine o'clock in the morning in New York, which was 6 a.m. at Palm Springs. We would get up and work together for an hour. And that is how She's the Last Model Standing came together. Wendy Stewart Kaplan with David Wallace. This book would not exist if he hadn't have worked with me. And now I've learned more and more. Whenever you hear about all these celebrities that have a book out, they're not writers either. That and they've you know gotten somebody hired somebody to help tell their story. Here's the irony though of all of this. I wasn't a writer when I wrote the book. Now people are hiring me because I'm so big in social media and I do and I've learned how to write. My God, I went from comments on Facebook to you know posting on on blogs to doing interviews where I get the questions. I'm writing the answers. They get published. I wrote the interview. I, I, my God, I write pretty damn good interviews. And now I've taken that to do that with other people. Like I could interview you and, and write a real kick butt piece about you, Mike. So you see, here we go. We're talking about curiosity and creativity. We're coming full circle with that, aren't we? Once again, no, I wasn't a writer, but I thought my story was, was worth telling. My book is a story of inspiration. It's about finally getting with a model agency, finally becoming a well-known person at Studio 54, meeting Andy Warhol, all right, being singled from the crowd, being offered a part in an Andy Warhol film, and being 21 years old and stupid and turning it down because he wasn't paying any money. What was I thinking? Okay. Meeting Madonna and thinking she was the most mediocre person on the face of the earth and she wasn't going anywhere. These are the <laughs> things we do when we're in our 20s, right? Because we think we know it all and we're not so smart. 
by the way, I love Madonna. Uh, Ray of Light for me was a breakthrough album in many ways. It was a ray of light. And I learned to see Madonna in a different life because her music totally became everything that I love. And she's been a really great inspiration to me. We are, uh, we've been around the same amount of time. And, you know, there's so much Madonna hate on the internet. These people should just freaking give it up. You know, she is a major and it just ends there. She's Madonna, whether you love her or hate her or whatever. Anybody that can influence the world to the way she, the way she has, give it up for the girl. So I, I wrote a book about the trials and tribulations of, of my life. And on the back cover, it says, you know, when I, when I talk about everything I've done, it's told in a Kathy Griffin-esque style. Kathy Griffin's a very well-known comedian with humor, untarnished by malice. And that untarnished by malice is no matter how bad it is. And I've got a million bad stories here. I mean, I got my start as an actress in a wet t-shirt contest in a film where like they didn't feed us. The hours were ungodly. And I still remember the um, director and producer Lloyd Kaufman from Troma Films yelling at midnight, okay, hose them down to this day. I remember, oh my God, the hose with the cold water for the wet t-shirt contest. But you learn to make lemonade out of those lemons. And I tell these stories and these stories are all in my book. She's the last model standing, which you can get on Amazon or you can get the Kindle edition. But I'm really proud of that book because I'm proud of what it, what it says. It's a real story about a real girl trying to do real things that could be anybody and how she triumphed to get all the way to now. And here we are. Well, today has been fascinating, very interesting. I'm going to have to spend a while to process all of the answers and pick out <laughs> some of the uh, pick out some of the words of wisdom there for sure. Wendy, it has been incredible. And if people wanted to check out the book, that's on Amazon. But if people wanted to enter your world a little bit more and really find out what you're all about. I'm assuming you're on social media and websites. Okay, I'm so. all over social media. So I'm going to give you all my handles. You can find me on Instagram under She's the Last Model Standing. You can find me on Facebook under Wendy Stewart, S T U A R T. You can uh, find me sometimes on Twitter. Um, not my favorite medium for no reason other than it's just one more thing that I'm supposed to do. And um, under Twitter, I'm under Wendy Stewart. And then, of course, there is my YouTube channel, which is really my pride and joy. All my work for the last two years, which has exploded. Uh, we're talking theater. We're talking podcasts. We're talking hosting. Uh, testimonials is all on there. And that is on YouTube. My channel is Wendy. Stuart, S-T-U-A-R-T, TV. And then, of course, there is my website, which is Wendy Stewart TV. That's all she wrote. <laughs> Thank you so much. No problem at all, Wendy. For those that are tuning in, make sure you subscribe if you haven't already. Feel free to share the show on social media, tagging Wendy and myself, and we'll, we'll share it. And you can also tell us what you thought of the episode. And I look forward to seeing you all again on the next episode. Bye-bye, everybody. Just before you take off, if you'd like to join my inner circle, which is accountability, access to me, and you also get the chance to have exclusive interviews with my podcast guests. If you click the link in the description for the podcast, you get a two-month free trial in the inner circle. I shall see you on the other side.